Okay, once again, good morning to everybody. It's so good to be here once again in class. Hope you had a good two week break, had a rest and uh, back. Uh, welcome to our e-learning students as well. Thank you for joining in um, every week, uh, going through this course. I trust that uh, it's been a blessing to you. Thank you for all those who responded to those discussion questions. Uh, really appreciate that some of you are uh, interacting through that uh, uh, mode of class. Uh, and thanks for all of you who've come in. Hope all of you are doing well. So um, we started off two weeks ago on Christian counseling. So would it would some of you um, you know, give me a brief about what we did last time. Um, what are some of the topics that we covered? Uh, just so that, you know, we can do a quick recap and get uh, into our next chapter. So you can look back at your notes um, if you already haven't and uh, uh, share what we, we did for the benefit of those who may not have joined last time. So, yes. Over to you. Maybe in one minute, a quick uh, recap. Yeah. Uh, so we sort of uh, saw about what counseling is and what counseling is not, and what are the core elements of biblical counseling. And we also saw the basic principle of uh, biblical counseling and also the core elements of a Christian counselor and the principles of counseling. Um, so, yeah, I think that's what we actually Thank said. You. We saw the seven principles of counseling, the purposeful expression of feeling and controlled emotional involvement, self-determination, acceptance, non-judgmental attitude, principle of confidentiality. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jafina. So were anyone, any one of you were able to employ these principles in your day-to-day -day interactions with people, maybe it could have been your family, it could have been your friends, it's where you're working, where you're ministering. Any one principle that you felt you could use in your daily interactions? Anybody? Because what we learn needs to come out in our practice too, isn't it? So anybody? Uh, I think uh, I actually met a girl in my PG uh, last mm -hmm. week. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, she she's uh, doing her uh, uh, first year in college. So she was telling about how the and how they think her to certain habits over here, and she was just telling like uh, I don't know how they do. Uh, so. So I just mean a lot of my heart because uh, when I say I like it, you have a uh, you have a Bible community around you, but world outside is not like that. Uh, people are different in so many things. But uh, I think I was I was more into listening this time. Uh, I was listening to her to. And I was also telling, uh, giving her some guidance as, as far as I can. So one thing that I was able to apply is listening. I think I was quite listening this time. I don't know whether I did it before, but this time, uh, as we learned, I gave a lot of time for conscious just of to it. let her out. Yeah. Mm. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jafina, for that. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Yes, Divya, go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually, we have a kind of a mother's group, like a mom's group. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the group, actually, um, we will have um, uh, like discussions, like we'll discuss prayer points, we'll be discussing on a verse from the scripture. Um, so uh, when each mom expresses, you know, their difficulties or, um, or the problems they're facing with their children, uh, Probably it are, uh, those are things that even we are facing, but sometimes, you know, for the mother to open up, um, we try uh, our best. One thing is it's confidential within the group. That is, it's like mm -hmm. a safe environment. So mm -hmm. we establish the fact that it is safe to confide. 
uh, as well as uh, the other things are uh, like when the mother expresses the problems that she faces, either we relate, uh, we try to relate to her uh, either with a past experience that we have faced or with something that we are currently facing. So it uh, mm, like opens up an avenue for the person to, you know, be safe and be free to express. And we, of course, pray. Uh, so it's kind of... Uh, uh, a good and safe environment yeah so nice nice yeah. that's that's encouraging to hear that you are you are being uh, uh, aware and conscious about how you are within a uh, conversation and it's a practice uh, everything also about counseling there are skills that uh, we need to practice so wonderful to hear that okay great so let's just start with a word of prayer and let's uh, move right in Heavenly Father, we submit our time of learning to your throne of grace. God, everything is made perfect in you and by your knowledge and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that uh, even as we unpack some part of learning about the personality of man and how they relate in their relationship with you, I pray that you will open our eyes to our own selves, to our own nature. May you open unto us what are the things that we run after. And Father, that you will align us to pursue you, Lord, to come after you. Father, thank you for each student here, for all those listening. God, we pray, Lord, that you will intervene in our lives, you will reveal truths about who you are and who we are and give us, Lord, the power by your spirit to change and to be, Lord, what you have desired us to be. May we grow into paths of maturity in being like you, Father. Thank you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so today we are getting into chapter two, and I'm on page uh, nine. Okay, um, I will take. I'm. I. I. I'd like to present. I'd, I'd like. I kind of put up a PowerPoint for y'all. So um, I think it will be helpful uh, just to go through the um, entire uh, uh, teaching through a through a presentation so you can you know take your time and go back and uh, read the um, the notes because they, they're the, the ppt is made um taken from the notes okay uh, are all of you able to see the ppt the the has it been shared yes you're able to view it right okay all right great okay so uh in this lesson we are going to be looking at a very important part of understanding what human needs are. Okay, But before we go through that, a quick uh, uh, understanding of what um, counseling is. We know that it is a process of helping. It is based on a relationship that is uh, built on acceptance, on trust. It is built on empathy. Now, this within this relationship, the counselor focuses on the counselee's feelings, thoughts, actions, so whatever they are going through in relation to the problem they may be presenting to you. You're focusing on their feelings, on their thoughts and their actions, and then you're bringing them to a place. You're empowering them to a place to cope with what is going on in their situation, to be able to understand and explore ways of how to deal with their problems. You're helping them to make their own decisions that they determine in their minds about their decisions. And you're also helping them to take responsibility for those decisions. So the goal in Christian counseling is to bring every person to a place of maturity in Christ. So this is some part of the aspects that we looked at the, the last time. Um, sorry. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, when we are looking at um, uh, understanding, uh, uh, you know, when, when we get into counseling, there is a lot of emphasis um, that is placed now, not just not just for us, but all those who are in the field of psychology or in the field of working with people, they place a great emphasis on the fact that one of the first things one must do in any kind of counseling or helping work is to work out a theory of personality. Okay, so to understand what is man and what are the needs of man, how do how do things evolve in a person's life? How do people deal with problems? Why do problems come about? Okay, As Christian counselors or as believers, we know better that understanding who God is and his nature, his purposes, is the foundation of our relationship with the counseling. Okay, So the image or picture that we have of God um, so, so in order for us to do that, we also need to understand the image and the picture that we have of God. So th that picture, the image that we have of God is usually influenced by many factors. Okay, How we see God, how we understand God, how we know God is influenced by many factors. Could some of you tell me what are the some of the influences that we may have of, of knowing, of understanding God? How do we know God? Please interact, you know, even if you chat, that's fine, but please interact. So how do we how do we know of God? How how is our image or picture of God? What what factors influences our picture or image of God? It's miracles. Miracles? Okay, what you see, okay, miracles. All right. What else? What are some of the obvious ways? We know who God is. Word of God. By the word of God. Yes. Then? Through our relationship with him. Through our relationship with him. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, it, it can be through the study of your of scripture by, by reading the word. It is through our prayer life. It's maybe the teaching that we have received um, uh, or the way that uh, that that God was modeled to us by those who nurtured us. So there are many factors of the way that we uh, are influenced uh, by who God is. But what does scripture say? What does scripture tell us? Okay. Uh, so what does scripture tell us? Scripture tells us about who God is. God is um, eternal. He is powerful. He is perfect. He's a God who's personal. He's a God who has a will, has an emotion, has emotions. He has an intellect. God is the one who is a relational. Okay, and we see this from Scripture. Okay, and how do we see God reveals Himself? He reveals Himself through His Word. He reveals Himself to us through uh, the person of Jesus. He reveals Himself through what we see in nature. Okay, so for we we see that a theory of personality is important, and we understand that as Christians, we base our foundation on what the Bible says about who God is and about the nature of man. All right, so we understand who God is through through the scriptures. Now, uh, in the same way, we we need to understand what. Scripture says about who man is. Okay, so we saw that God has revealed about Himself to us through the Word, through the person of His Son Jesus, and through all that He's created. And that's how He's revealed to us. That's how we get to understand and know Him, know Him more and more. Now, what is um, uh, what is man, or what is the nature of man? And we read that in Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Would somebody just open up the Bible and read that, please? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Somebody? 
Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Thank you. So what does it say? It says that the nature of man is the way that God created him. So when, when God created us, he created us in the image of God. He made us people who are relational. He gave us a free will. He made us eternal beings. Okay. Now, why is this important to understand? Why do we need to understand man in order to just work through um, uh, while working with man? Now, in order to repair something, right, you need to understand how it is made. Like, for example, let's say, you know, your your phone, if something happens to your phone, or let's say any kind of an electronic item, you need to really go back to the manual to really open it up and see what it what is wrong. So if you need to repair it, you need to know how it was made in the first place. Okay, so so also in order to help man, in order to repair what may have gone wrong or restored what is gone wrong, you need to know how it was originally made. Okay, so the more complex the problem, the greater and more detailed is the the understanding, right? So if the problem is is let's say in a in a in a certain software. You need to know a lot more about what software is used. So that may not be something like a layman like me may do. I may need to go take it to a specialist, right? So the greater the understanding, the easier it will be for us to work alongside with God uh, so that he seeks to restore that personality. So sometimes problems are so deeply entrenched and to understand the very um, the very nature of man is necessary to really help them go through a, a point of restoration. Okay, so one thing that we um, we we see is that people God has um, given us uh, to be free moral agents. What does that mean? God has given us the right to make a choice. Right, like you you see in the Garden of Eden. There was certain, um, uh, uh, there was an instruction that was given, right? But God did not tie Adam and Eve's hands and says, you know, nothing doing, you can't, or, you know, put a fence, none of that. God has given the freedom to man to be, to have, to have rights to make a personal choice. But we need to understand, but we are not given the right to choose the consequence. Okay, so God has given man the right also to choose our destiny, our eternal destiny, right? Um, uh, as you read in John 5, 24, it says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death to life. So God has given us a choice, whether we choose him or whether we choose uh, whether we choose anything outside of him. So that is a choice that God has given us. Okay. Similarly, when we say that we are eternal beings, man has, uh, has eternity placed in our hearts. We have, um, because after the last judgment, man exists either in eternal fire or eternal life. And there, there is, we are eternal beings. We are going to be uh, eternally, but we make the choice right now whether it is going to be with God in eternal life or uh, in eternal hell. Okay, so that's something that we need to understand. Now, um, uh, as as we move forward, okay. Uh, uh, so what we uh, so what does it mean to be an image bearer? Okay, so what are we talking about is when God made Adam and Eve, he made Adam and Eve to be an image bearer, which means that we, uh, Adam and Eve, were designed, or man was designed to resemble God and reflect his true nature. Okay, so to be an image bearer means that we are designed to resemble God 
and reflect who he is and reflect his nature. So before the fall, before sin, there were certain attributes that was inherently in man. Okay, And what were they? You, you would see that in the diagram, that they felt perfectly loved, they were perfectly secure, and they were perfectly significant. Okay, They were perfectly loved. Okay, that is, they, they were, they, they just knew that they were loved by God because they were made in the image of God. They resembled God. They, there was no need of love. That attribute was there. They were perfectly valued, okay, or they had a sense of security of being one with Christ in their identity with God. And they were significant. There was a perfect purpose for them um, as God had created. This was an attribute that there was prior to the fall. Now, this changed, however, when they sinned. So they still have the capacity for, uh, for love. They have the capacity for security. And they have the capacity for sig significance, but they had no way of satisfying it because of sin and the separation that came as a result. Okay, I'm just going to repeat that because this is very, it's crucially important for us to understand that. So prior to the fall, prior when, when God created man, he inherently created us with these attributes of, self, of worth, that is of being loved, of security that is being valued and significance that's having a meaning or a purpose, okay, that was as an attribute that was there, okay, because of the identity that man had with God. But because sin came, because man chose to sin, and because of the fallen nature of man, this changed, although they had the capacity for uh, worth of a security, of a significance, uh, for the, the same words that I use there for love, for um, uh, security, or for meaning or purpose, they had no way of satisfying it. Okay? Uh, is there any question up to you? Because I, this is really important for you all to understand. Any question here before I move on? Okay, I think it's fairly clear. So then we, we'll move ahead. So, um, just a little deer out um, from, from the main point of topic that we're talking about, because I just, uh, you know, we, we just need to uh, have a have an understanding of this, which I'm sure most of you do have, but it's it's important for us to, uh, to look into, okay? So what, when you're looking at man, what is man made out of and uh, made up of? And I think we all know that he is a, three, a tripartite being. And uh, the verses that talks about is about this is in First Thessalonians five twenty three that it says, "I pray God your whole body, whole spirit and body um, and soul be preserved and blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus." So man is a triune being and is composed of the spirit, the soul, and the body. Okay. Um, so th that's something that we, I think it's it's uh, clear to all of us. Now, just uh, uh, just a quick um, uh, again, just a quick uh, knowledge and um, you know in depth understanding about this. All right. Now, when before the fallen state of man, okay, the spirit of man was one with God, okay, but when the human race fell in Adam, sin was what closed the window of the spirit, okay? And the, the chamber of, of the spirit almost became like a death chamber and, and, and remains like that in every heart until the light uh, of the, the light of uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, of, of uh, the Holy Spirit floods into this, into our hearts and gives us the power of new life in Christ Jesus. And I think that's that's pretty uh, simple and easy for us to understand. So it develops that the spirit of man uh, has the sphere of God consciousness, okay? That is the inner or the private part of man where the work of regeneration takes place, okay? So that is where the Holy Spirit 
uh, works in us and that part of man's nature which is uh, joined with God. So until and unless the spirit of man joins or uh, is is willing to receive the life-giving power of, of Christ Jesus, we continue to remain dead in our spirits, okay? And uh, we, we have seen that, you know, the, 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 what happens in the spirit, as the apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians um, 2, 9 to 11, I'll just read it. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor no ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Okay, so many times we stop there. Okay, and uh, we, we, we do not take what what reads later, but but you know Paul continues. For God had revealed them unto by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God know no man but the Spirit of God. So it is only in the uh, power of the Holy Spirit, do we know what, what is there in, in our spirits? Again, it's only in our um, restoration with God and with the Spirit of uh, with, with the Holy Spirit, do we begin to see um, what are the needs and what are the issues of, of our soul or, or of our body, the, the other two spheres of it. Okay. Now, when we go to the second part, it's the soul. Now, man is... Uh, not only not only do we have a living soul but we are called live we are a living soul okay and we, the bible says that in genesis 2 7 the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul okay so we must be careful not to confuse that which is spiritual that which is of the spirit and that which is merely of the soul Okay, we have seen that the spirit of man is the sphere of activity or place where the Holy Spirit regenerates. Okay, brings back, brings anew. Uh, the soul is the sphere or the place where where Satan can operate, where where he makes his targets or his appeals to the affections and emotions of our man, of the man. Okay, so the soul is the seat of every passion. It is the uh, seat of our feelings. It, it is where the desires uh, come by. And, um, you know, Satan is, is the master of, of occupying these, these places. Okay. So it, you will see in scripture where it talks a lot about um, things to do with the soul. You know, it says about abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Or it talks about um, in, uh, in, uh, just a minute, I think it's in Proverbs 25, verse 25. Yeah, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. So you see that the soul of man is where affections and desires are not directed Godward until after the spirit has become regenerated. So man cannot love God nor the things of God until he is born from above. And that's something we, we know when we understand. So man's desires and affections are turned towards God when we uh, realize our sinful condition and when we realize that there is God's grace in salvation. So when the Spirit of God illuminates our, our spirits um, with his life, with his light, then man begins to yield his affection and all kinds of faculties to God. Okay, and the the third part is 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 the body where um, we house the 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 soul and whatever is working in the soul gets manifested out from the body. Okay, any questions up until here before we move forward? No, no. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so. Um, Going back again, so we need to understand, um, we, we, we were talking about how before the fall, there are these attributes that we have. We were, we were loved, we were significant, and we had value, okay? Now, before we move on to the next part of it, it, it will all come into understanding once, you know, I keep progressing. So as an image bearer, when you 
when we bear an image of God, remember we said we resemble God and we reflect his nature. Now, how do we resemble God and reflect his nature? There are five areas of the way that we function. Okay, That's how we reflect God and reflect um, uh, his nature. So the five things, and I'll, I'll go through each of them. First one is the spiritual being. Just as God is spirit, uh, this also finds expression in man as the image of God. So at the core of our personality lies an area of being that can function effectively only when the spirit is in contact with God. Like we said, every man has a God-shaped vacuum. We all have, whether we understand it or no, or whether people know it or uh, or, or agree or not, we all have a deep yearning for a close and intimate relationship with God and with others. Okay, There is the yearning of having that uh, intimacy with God. That's, that's what is our area of functioning. We function like that. We spiritually all function, you know, in a, on, on a regular basis. This is one of the core parts of it where we need, we yearn to for an intimate relationship with God. The second part is what we call the rational being. What is a rational being? The word rational means the ability to think or the ability to reason or the ability to understand or to comprehend. Okay, and scripture does place a lot of emphasis on the ability of man to be able to think and reason and evaluate and understand and, and, and use wisely. And this is, again, a nature of God. You know, God says, reason with me, right? So the, this is, again, a nature of God that God's given us. As an image bearer, we function through a as a rational being. The third is an emotional being. Um, so now this is this this I goes I, I suppose goes without much of explanation. We are emotional emotional beings, and we do see uh, in different places of scripture where where we see that even Jesus uh, has this nature part of him. Okay, the the ability to feel like if you see in Hebrews four fifteen it says the high priest of ours understands our weakness, so he knows what our weakness is, and it says, for he faced the same testing like we do, right? So God has faced the same uh, emotional <coughs> burdens or struggles that we do, but yet he was without sin, okay? So one of the major, uh, um, the emotional uh, part of us, or the emotional functioning of us, plays a major role in determining whether our life is meaningful or miserable okay so in god is the one who's given us emotions and often emotions act like a barometer you know it, it's like a thermometer it's like a gauge that makes you understand what is going wrong or what is not going wrong so it, it is not a bad thing having emotions makes you human makes you makes you to feel, makes you to uh, enjoy things around, makes you to understand your intimacy with God. So that that is a beautiful part of what how God has made us. Okay, so we ex sometimes we experience some emotions which we were originally designed to experience. So these emotions that are given to us is for us to experience and uh, and enjoy things that are given to us. So that's another part. So we said spiritual beings, we are rational beings, we are um, uh, emotional beings. The fourth one, we are um, volitional beings. Okay, what does volitional beings mean? Volitional, the word volition is the power um, or the ability to choose which is this part of it is our will, okay? That we have, God has given us the ability or the power to choose, okay? He's not made us like puppets. He's not made us like robots, but he's given us the ability to choose. So man, just like God, has the power to set his will to choose and move in a certain direction. So man, we're not puppets. We have a free will and many elements can influence our decision. But like I said, like we said earlier, the Bible is very clear 
on the fact that we are responsible for those personal choices. Okay. And last is the physical being. Now, we know God does not have a body as he's poor spirit, but in his creation of man, the image of God is designated to function in a frame, in a human frame, which the spirit and the soul can be effectively expressed. So this are the five areas of functioning that 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 we see okay um now when, when we when we're looking at uh, we being uh, people being image bearers remember they carry in their nature um they carry in their nature the image of god their creator and uh, and this is the reality and the foundation of all Christian counseling, that every person who comes to you bears the image of God, okay? They are made in the image of their creator God. Whether they choose him or whether they do not choose him, they, we understand that oh, man is made in the image of God. So that's a reality and a foundation of whatever we do in counseling, okay? So God is making us like himself and he has bestowed dignity upon us, right? But because of the fall, people are not only dignified, they are also depraved, okay? So when man sinned, the image of God was damaged. The image was not lost. Man does not lose his image, but it becomes marred. It becomes in other words, we could say spoiled or it becomes corrupted because of sin. Okay, so what does this mean? That the design that God created man, the image God created us to be, to have dig dignity, has been violated by sin. And that's why we, we become depraved. And as a result, there is self-centeredness, there is self-concern, and there is an attempt to make our lives work by self-effort rather than dependency on God, okay? So because of the fall, um, we are depraved, right? And we seek, as man seeks to make life better by our self-effort rather than the dependency on God because of the depravity that has come to us um, because of the sin, all right? So remember, although we have dignity because we are image bearers. We also are depraved because of sin. So this is how we see ourselves. Yes, people who are bearing the image of God with dignity, but yet people who have been of fallen nature and as a result depraved. So when we look at others, we look at them with this lens. We understand that they are, uh, they have value. They have uniqueness. They have uh, uh, the dignity that God bestowed upon them. But because of sin, they are also depraved and chooses things that can be outside of the dependency of God. Okay. And so, what what is what was what does that mean? Or what what would it mean when we're looking at it in in you know in in the initial picture? So, as a result, remember I said before the fall, we had attributes. Right? There were those attributes of self-worth, that is, of being loved, of security and of significance, those attributes then become needs, okay? Those attributes, for them, before the fall, you didn't even, if I were to put it, you didn't even know that you needed to be loved because you were inherently loved or you needn't understand if you had a purpose. You knew you had a purpose or you needn't understand if you felt value. You knew you had value. But because of the fall, because of the depravity of sin, all of this has become needs. So like I said, people do still have the capacity for security, significance and worth, but they had no way of satisfying it. And so the urge or drive to meet their needs become very powerful motivators in their personalities, all right? And those needs, when they don't feel loved, they it becomes a powerful motivation to find love. When people don't find purpose, it becomes a powerful motivation to find purpose. When they don't feel a value, that becomes a powerful motivation to find that sense of security. So remember, 
that the needs we are talking about here are vital for the proper functioning of the personality, which we said, those five areas. If needs are met, we can we function better. Like, for example, if, if you, um, let's say physical needs, if you have uh, food to eat, you know, you're able to reason better, right? Or you're, you're able to, um, uh, you know, feel a lot more satisfied. Uh, you're able to probably make some choices. Uh, you know, spiritually also you feel a lot more settled. You find that whenever there is an issue or when, the, when, when there are needs that are there, these five areas of functioning also, also tends to, to crumble, tends to become an issue. So needs become huge motivators they become powerful motivators for people right okay uh, any questions up until now before we proceed no questions no no i hope everyone is here in attention or have i put anyone to sleep we are awake they're awake. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So we were, we, were, we were looking at how, you know, as a result of the fall, those attributes become needs and these needs are what becomes very, very strong motivators for us. So let's just look at a couple of examples to, to help you see how, you know, needs become strong motivators. Now, let's say, for example, when you're thirsty, you have a need of thirst there is a motivation, right? You you need to go get something because there is a desire to, to just quench your thirst. And so what do you do? You get into behavior, you, you buy a drink. And because the goal is, okay, I, I, I don't want to feel thirst. Okay, so this is a very simple example. Let's look at, a, at, a, at an example of, of what we spoke about, those attributes. Let's say love, we said, right? One of the, uh, the biggest attributes that God gave us before, uh, that, that we had before the fall was the feeling of being loved because of our identity of who we are in God. But because of the fall, that becomes a need. So let's say maybe, you know, a, a, a person is having a, a conversation with with a with with their family member, and somebody says something that is mean or that is a curt or angry. There is immediate a sense of 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 a lack of love. Okay, and that becomes maybe maybe that that becomes a need. Okay, the lack of love becomes a need, and the motivation is to begin to have it back. So then. It probably leads to a behavior. They may go back to, you know, to fight, to make them feel understood. They go back and they, you know, try and uh, get into a conversation where they want to feel understood, where they want to express what they're feeling. Why? The goal is I want to know that I am needed and loved in this relationship. Okay. Or let's let's talk about a purpose. Let's say somebody loses a job. All right. It becomes a need because suddenly there isn't a purpose, there isn't a meaning in their lives. And that kind of motivates them into maybe some kind of a behavior in order to feel a sense of purpose. And sometimes this behavior is uh, is uh, because of, of who we are and the kind of sinful nature we may have outside of our dependency of God, we may choose certain negative ways in order to get back that significance. Maybe that's point of time is, okay, maybe it's, it's money that's going to get me the significance. There isn't anything that's going to fill this need of purpose. And suddenly I feel there isn't anything that I have. So you know, it may be a pursuit of money or it may be a pursuit of fame or it may be a pursuit in a relationship in order to meet a certain goal. So the needs tend to become strong motivators in our lives going forward. Okay. Now, uh, when we are looking at needs, we need to see that there are uh, generally there are three different kinds of of needs that we that we see okay uh, in order for us to be effective or to live effectively there are needs need to be met and there are three um areas or three specific um, how would i put it parts of, of our needs okay so if you look at the topmost one are the casual longings or the casual needs. And these are, uh, you know, your casual needs are those needs that uh, even if they are not met, you know, life can go about just the same. 
that is there's no problem even if if it is in met so let me let me give you an uh, example so the casual casual needs what what could be some casual needs for example uh, you know um uh, uh it, it it may be something like uh, maybe you didn't get your favorite meal uh, or you wanted to go to to a certain restaurant that you liked and you couldn't go there it didn't happen okay but uh, life is not affected when these needs are not met okay it does not bring you too much of a discomfort it you may experience some discomfort but but not too much of it or uh, let's say you know you wanted to you wanted a um, you wanted a particular um, uh, maybe house to live in all right and you had certain ideas about what it was but it didn't arrange it didn't come away like that maybe you didn't have the money right so it those it, they are they may be so the, these needs you need to understand range from being trivial to being significant okay so your your some of this like i wish this restaurant was there or uh, i wish the weather was better i wish i got that house you know uh, i wish i got to stay in another country so all of that uh, it your life doesn't truly get in general it doesn't get affected if these needs aren't met so that's what we call as the casual longings or the casual needs that one may have okay um just going back to the previous one this the second one is what we call is the critical needs or the critical longings uh what does this mean just yeah so the critical longings is the part where um where where we see it does it, the examples of these critical needs are those that you relate to a relationship or relate to maybe money or relate to career those critical longings that you know are met in maybe one's relationship with a spouse or with with friends or with uh, children um those are those important desires of a quality relationship um you know when when there are experiences maybe at workplace when there are discomforts in that that happens uh that that's what we look at when we're talking about critical needs those kind of needs that impact you that can significantly impact you but the recovery can happen after some time okay so if we were to look at another example okay like for example the company that you work in has decided to retrench and you're sure that your job is at stake you you have always managed with a single income but now with two kids at school and a huge loan to pay off your concern okay so what kind of emotions do you think you will experience you would feel um you know a sense of burden you may feel a sense of struggle there may be a sense of worry uh, of fear uh, anxiety apprehension because the, the, these things matter to you right and it's not something that you could just sleep over and say okay all, all things will be okay it does bring about a certain sense of discomfort so this is what we will call as or what we call as critical needs things that are necessary um and if that doesn't happen it can bring about some form of a discomfort okay so going just going back to those slides um we spoke about the casual needs we spoke about critical needs and we will talk about crucial needs once we get back uh, from the break so these are the different kinds of needs that we may experience okay uh, any question here we have a minute before we close for a coffee break any any questions No. Yes, Divya, go ahead. Uh, so these three uh, areas, uh, like needs that you told, ma'am, uh, is it? Does it span across all the all the um, five uh, areas, like spiritual, physical, rational? Yeah, all those um, em emotional. All okay, these. Okay, so. Uh, those are the areas of functioning how we function the needs affect our functioning right like for example let's say you lose your job it affects your emotional part of you it affects your spiritual part it affects uh, some part of your uh, um, physical self right look at look at the casual needs You, you didn't get to go to a restaurant it doesn't affect your those five areas of functioning very much right depending on the intensity of it they affect 
your areas of functioning. It's not that every area of functioning has those needs. It affects the way that you, you think or the way that you feel or the way that you, uh, you, you make a decision. It affects it. So that's what we're talking about, the needs. These are the five areas of functioning in an individual, okay? And it affects it. When, when these needs aren't met, it gets affected. You'll, you'll, you'll get it a little bit more clearer once I uh, describe the third one, which is the most crucial longings or the crucial needs. Okay? Is that clear? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll stop for a break and uh, we will come back in 10 minutes. It's 10.51. We will be back at 11.01. Right? See you all soon. Thank, thank you, ma. 